All right, everybody. Well, welcome uh, to my uh, latest office hour. Thanks for joining. Today, I think the focus will probably be uh, on a region uh, quite far from California, talking about recent events on the Arabian Peninsula, including the extreme and record-shattering rainfall and flooding that occurred uh, most uh, prominently in, in Dubai, in the United Arab Emirates, but also uh, really even more severely in adjacent countries. Uh, including Oman and Yemen. Uh, and the reason why I wanted to talk about all of this in this normally uh, more California and Western U.S. focused setting is because there's been a great deal of uh, online uh, discussion, shall we say, and discussion in, in the news media surrounding sort of the context of this event uh, rumors about cloud seeding, and also some conspicuous absence in the conversation surrounding discussion of the role of climate change in seeing extreme rain events like this. So I uh, plan to do a little bit of myth busting, uh, a little bit of uh, Middle East meteorology, and uh, just take a look at some of the data and, and about some philosophical questions about why uh, public perceptions surrounding things like weather modification and geoengineering are often very far from the reality uh, that we have in the world today and how that sort of juxtaposes with our uh, underestimation of just how profound the human influence uh, on climate is more broadly. And this notion that many people are willing to believe that we can uh, uh, uniquely control individual weather events by some means of technology, and yet even in that context, some of these very same folks find it very hard to believe that human activities over decades and centuries can affect climate at global scales. Uh, which one of these is actually happening and, and affecting uh, the world around us? Uh, it may not be the one that you think. Uh, this audience, I suppose, perhaps most people have it right, but I do think it's worth having this conversation, especially uh, with the journalists who are joining today, because this is the recent events have been in the news a lot. And what, what I do want to uh, sort of uh, preempt is a conversation that I know is going to happen eventually about different forms of geoengineering uh, from small to large scales and whether or not uh, it can be tied to specific weather events. And this is likely to become a major problem moving forward in both directions, both people over attributing events to geoengineering that in some cases probably did not have much of an effect or if any at all, but in other cases, uh, perhaps underestimating or perhaps uh, experiencing uncertainty in whether it's possible to attribute specific uh, human activities to specific weather events in specific places, and how that hypothesis for that could result in all sorts of geopolitical and legal chaos in the decades to come. So I think this is really the first big modern example um, of an event that ironically I don't think had anything to do with cloud seeding or geoengineering, but a lot of folks sure seem to think it does, and there is already uh, geopolitical fallout from that likely misconception. So kind of an interesting uh, topic that, that that hits at a lot of different things that are, are, are uh, prominent in the discourse right now. Uh, I will briefly mention that uh, from a California weather perspective, uh, there's not a whole lot going on. It's getting warmer. There may be more uh, April or May showers to come. I'll write a new blog post next week. Not a, too, not, not a great deal to talk about right now, neither extreme heat nor remarkable rain in the near future. So classic and largely pleasant spring-like weather for now. Okay, so uh, the events that I'm focused on, uh, as you probably have seen the imagery uh, on TV or in the newspaper, regarding this really extreme uh, rainfall event that occurred I would say broadly throughout the eastern Arabian Peninsula and even across the sea into uh, places like uh, portions of Iran, 
But what happened was there was just an incredible uh, 24 to 36 hour period of genuinely extreme and in many cases record-breaking rainfall that occurred uh, in places like the United Arab Emirates, uh, Oman, and adjacent regions. And these are, of course, places that are famous or perhaps infamous for their extreme heat uh, and general uh, aridity from a precipitation perspective. Uh, a key point here uh, that I'm going to be mentioning repeatedly moving forward is that these are notably not dry places from a humidity perspective. Uh, California, of course, uh, can get quite hot in summer, especially the inland deserts, but generally speaking, it's a dry heat, which is one of the things that makes uh, the ex temperatures extremes in the desert southwest of the United States a lot more tolerable uh, in, for a lot of folks than lesser, lower temperature heat extremes elsewhere in places that are a lot more humid. So compare a 98 degree uh, Miami afternoon in July, for example, with a 105 degree day in Sacramento. I'm going to take that 105 degrees in Sacramento uh, any day because the humidity difference is so large that it more than outweighs the fact that the temperatures might be a good 5, 10, or even 20 degrees warmer because the effect of humidity on the body uh, is essentially that high humidity environments combined with heat prevent you from sweating effectively and the less effectively you sweat, the more uncomfortable it feels, partly because that excess moisture accumulates on your skin. You get sweaty. That sweat doesn't evaporate as easily, and it is the evaporation of sweat from the surface of your skin that cools your body. That is physiologically how humans primarily cool themselves um, in terms of passive body systems. Some animals pant, like a dog, for example, but humans sweat, and it's not the act of sweating per se that cools us off, but it's the uh, essentially the micro scale meteorology of the human skin that cools us off when that sweat then evaporates uh, and where the heat flows away from the body. The more humid it is, the harder it is to actually evaporate that sweat, the more muggy, the grosser it gets. For perspective, Places like Dubai are widely known uh, around the world as being the most uncomfortable uh, combinations of heat and humidity anywhere on Earth. Dubai is a coastal city uh, built really right on the water, and the water there, for perspective, is like uncomfortably hot. Uh, right now, for example, the water temperature is, is in uh, the 70s and 80s, which is quite cool for this part of the world, in the summer water temperature in the shallow sea can approach or even exceed 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Again, this is the temperature of the seawater near Dubai. And so the humidity can reach levels relatively close to that ocean temperature level. Often in coastal cities, you'll see uh, dew points that are close to those water temperatures. Now, in San Francisco in summer, for example, that dew point uh, is going to be perhaps a 50 to 55 degrees, uh, or even a little bit cooler, maybe even, uh, maybe even in the 40s degrees Fahrenheit. That's why San Francisco foggy days in the summer can be so cold and clammy, because the, the, the dew point is close to the temperature of the surface ocean, which can be around 50 degrees Fahrenheit, which is quite cold. That means that in the summer, the water temperature off the coast of San Francisco can be 50 degrees Fahrenheit, or close to it, colder than the ocean temperature off the coast of Dubai. So although uh, Dubai and, say, Sacramento or Palm Springs can reach similarly high temperatures in summer, there's just no comparison. The humidity in these uh, very hot and humid desert regions in the Middle East can be just just almost hard to conceive of for folks who've never experienced it. And the reason I bring this up is that there's a perception that deserts are always hot and dry. And from a precipitation perspective, Dubai and UAE are indeed dry. The average annual precipitation in Dubai isn't much more than four to five inches. That's lower than almost everywhere in California outside of the very driest parts of southeastern California deserts. 
Uh, so uh, LA, for example, might see three or even four times the average annual rainfall of Dubai, and LA is often considered a fairly dry place uh, by broader standards. So how can you have that much humidity in a place, just extreme, uncomfortable, dangerous levels of heat and humidity, and have so little rainfall? The answer is that humidity uh, does not uh, rainfall make. And just because there's moisture in the atmosphere does not mean that you see the formation of clouds and subsequently precipitation under all circumstances. You need some mechanism to squeeze that moisture, if you will, out of the atmosphere and to do so from clouds. And what you need is essentially upward vertical motion. So you can think of uh, upward and downward motions in the atmosphere uh, on average are small. If you average over the whole globe, uh, the horizontal winds are vastly stronger and more consistent than the vertical winds. In fact, that's, it's, that, that makes part of an assumption, that makes part of uh, uh, an important physical uh, force balance in the atmosphere known, known as the hydrostatic balance or the hydrostatic approximation essentially assumes that vertical accelerations in the atmosphere are on sufficiently large scales essentially negligible. Now the problem is, and this is one of the reasons why we need high resolution modeling that don't make this assumption to model extreme rain events and thunderstorms is that locally that assumption does not apply. In an individual cloud, for example, or even in a small scale weather system, you can have pretty strong upward vertical winds known as updrafts or accelerations, meaning that the, uh, the vertical winds uh, become stronger with height, for example. And this is important because that's exactly the kind of environment that we see during most major storms, and in particular during severe convective storms or thunderstorms, which is what occurred across a broad portion of the Middle East and Dubai earlier this week. So what's lacking in this part of the world is upward vertical motion. There isn't enough atmospheric instability across a deep enough layer of the atmosphere to trigger that spontaneous upward vertical motion that you might see, say, on a Florida afternoon. The one saving grace in Miami is that it often does rain on the hottest days because you get those pop-up tropical thunderstorms. In Dubai, the atmosphere is just too stable for that upward vertical motion to occur most of the time. But as they say in deserts often, when it rains, it often pours, even if it doesn't do so very often. And that's certainly true in Dubai, where the rain that does fall, the several inches per year, often occur during pretty intense but brief downpours uh, during winter, uh, and to a lesser extent spring. Summers there are very dry. But winter and the transition seasons, if you're going to get a downpour in this part of the Middle East, that's likely when it's going to happen. So we're sort of on the tail end of that season, but we're not completely outside of it at this point in mid-April. And the reason why upward vertical motion does occasionally materialize is because you have uh, the, these meandering cutoff low pressure systems. And, and of course, uh, UAE and, and the Arabian Peninsula broadly is at a fairly low latitude. So mid-latitude weather systems don't often make it that far south. How often do you see cutoff lows uh, say in Baja, California, for example, along the west coast of the U.S. It, it does occasionally happen, but it's certainly not nearly as common as in central or northern California or even southern California. That likelihood goes down once you get into the subtropical doldrums. And one of the reasons why they're called doldrums, uh, by the way, is because the winds uh, and the weather tends to be pretty stable and benign most of the time. But when you do have one of these weather disturbances, a cutoff low pressure system, for example, as we saw uh, move over the Arabian Peninsula earlier this week, that can provide a focal point for upward vertical motion in the atmosphere uh, and, and for sort of a release of the potential instability that's there. And under those circumstances is when these weather systems can take advantage of the fact that there's essentially a ludicrous amount of water vapor in the lower levels of the atmosphere because of that bathtub warm water. It's worth noting, and I'll show this in a minute, that the ocean temperature, the sea temperature, uh, really surrounding the entire Arabian Peninsula, so both of the seas plus the Indian Ocean to the south and east, all of which are vastly warmer even than they normally are, which is to say 
even hotter than their already hot background values right now. This undoubtedly played a role in why uh, these precipitation events on the Arabian Peninsula were just so extreme in recent days. So without further ado, I want to share a screen uh, and to show uh, sort of what I'm trying to, uh, to illustrate right now. So what you're going to see now on screen uh, is a map of ocean surface temperature anomalies. In other words, the degree to which the sea surface temperature in this region is either warmer or cooler than average right now. And what's pretty apparent, uh, and again, I'm talking about this region uh, as, as, as most, many folks who are familiar with the geography, we're talking, this is the Arabian Peninsula up here. And Dubai is, a, is about here, uh, UAE. Uh, Oman is here. And these are the two countries that were most severely affected by, by these events. So look, until the last couple of days, the water temperatures in this region have been f uh, well above average, one to three centigrade, uh, so up to five degrees Fahrenheit warmer than average. And notice the last couple of days it cools down, but that's actually because of the storm itself, which sort of added a bunch of rainwater and churned up the surface. So the only reason why it's so slightly cooler than average in this limited area at the very end of this animation is that the storm itself introduced this cooling. In fact, you might even be able to see some cool water runoff from the wadis uh, in Oman, uh, cooling the surface temperature of the water right along here, as long as some near coastal upwelling, which is pretty remarkable. Uh, it shows you the extremity of the event. But here's something else I wanted to show you. Uh, and this was a, this was a forecast made, uh, let's see, uh, April 15th, I believe that was uh, Monday, but this is uh, zero Zulu on April 15th, and so that would have been uh, essentially the, the around uh, midnight on Sunday uh, prior to the event. Here's uh, a different uh, model domain than I normally show, but this is uh, the, the European uh, weather model uh, as it depicted events from Sunday night. Uh, moving forward into when the event occurred. And again, I want to highlight the region of interest here is here. So this, this country on the map is United Arab Emirates and Oman is here. So already at this time, there is some very intense rainfall and convective activity over the mountainous regions of Oman here, but there's nothing yet going on over uh, UAE and Dubai. But take a look at this, this surface flow over central Saudi Arabia. Again, this is a surface flow pressure system literally over this, the, the vast sandy expanses of central Saudi Arabia, and yet it's producing uh, some rainfall over Saudi Arabia. And because, of course, you have cyclonic flow around low pressure systems, imagine this. You have, uh, essentially, you have wind flow in this direction around the center of circulation and look at this, uh, the sea here, as I mentioned, is very, very warm. So there's a tremendous amount of low level moisture that gets entrained. And in fact, this is likely why there's rain first developing on the north side of this low pressure system, because that's where the fetch of open uh, water is coming off of this very warm body of water. But if I step forward in time uh, with this prediction, as you'll see, uh, this low pressure system meanders over Saudi Arabia and then reforms over southeastern Saudi Arabia close to uh, UAE itself, uh, staying just south of the region and producing a really prolonged period of extreme precipitation right over UAE, parts of Oman, and then also over parts of Iran on the other side of the strait. Uh, again, these are very high values uh, for uh, a, a part of the world that normally only sees a few inches of rain a year, uh, essentially a, a 24 to 36 hour period of potentially extreme rainfall. And to give you a sense of just how much the European model was predicting, again, this was a prediction from before the event, again, showing uh, this is the accumulated precipitation. Uh, Dubai is, is right about here. Uh, and this, uh, on the scale of the map, is about 150 millimeters of rain. That's getting pretty close to 6 inches in a 24-hour period, which is very close to what was actually observed. So I bring this up now for two reasons. One is to illustrate 
the broader pattern. And I'm going to do that again in a moment. Uh, but also to illustrate that this did not come out of nowhere, as some have claimed, was actually very well predicted, despite being a historically rare event. Uh, in the days leading up to the event, the weather models were indeed predicting a historic rainfall event exactly where one occurred. But this is a little bit different from my usual statements about why that's important, which is to bolster uh, meteorology and be a bit of a booster for weather science, but also because this is essentially uh, fairly concrete evidence that the uh, purported influence of cloud seeding, which, by the way, these models don't know anything about, did not play a major role, because if the model was predicting about six inches of rain, not being aware of any cloud seeding activities, and about six inches of rain actually fell, that's a pretty good argument that you didn't need to know anything about any potential cloud seeding activities to understand the processes that led to this event. So again, I just want to step through this, and the other piece here is there's this cutoff low, but there's also this strong subtropical jet streak. This is at an unusually low latitude. Usually the jet streak, you know, we're talking at, this is not much more, this is at about 20 to 25 degrees north latitude. Uh, in this part of the world, that's quite a low latitude jet, and it noses into uh, United Arab Emirates and northeastern Oman and the mountains there, and essentially anchors itself right over the region. So that's this is a very favorable pattern uh, in this, this exit region of, of the jet streak for upward vertical motion, the generation of intense showers and thunderstorms. So in a moisture-rich environment with a lot of instability and a significant amount of wind shear, you get severe thunderstorms with torrential rainfall, and that's exactly what happened in Dubai. It's why you saw all these images of jets, aircrafts uh, taking off and landing in, in some cases, a couple of feet of water, I was very surprised to see large aircraft actually moving around under those conditions. The airport is apparently still largely inoperable. It's why you saw images of Lamborghinis floating down the... Uh, I'm trying to think of the right word. Grotesquely wide boulevards uh, of, of the city. Um, remarkably out of place and out of context uh, for the setting. And yet totally explainable by well-understood meteorological processes and also by the fact that this is a part of the world that occasionally does see extreme convective and thunderstorm downpours. This is singularly the most extreme rain event in Dubai's history by a significant margin. So it is a, probably a multi-centennial recurrence interval event, at least in a stable climate. We'll get to that in a moment. But this is an event that is, you know, the magnitude of this event was extraordinary for Dubai, and it happened to hit a now very highly populated area that has grown massively in recent decades. This was a city that essentially didn't exist 30 years ago and is now uh, a, a vast city with massive amount of pavement, uh, skyscrapers, and infrastructure that wasn't there, and clearly was not built to accommodate six inches of rain in 24 hours as occurred. This has been a very disruptive and damaging event for that city. Notably, the event was actually even more catastrophic in the mountainous parts of uh, Oman, where there are far fewer people, but with the topography is far more conducive to extreme, devastating flash flooding. And in, and in Oman, a number of people have actually died, and there's been major infrastructure and urban flood damage there as well. So you can see this jet streak persisted for a while and then essentially uh, weakened uh, and has since uh, moved on, or will since move on. Uh, but one last thing to show this, this cutoff low pressure system, uh, and this is just that, that 500 millibar height anomaly, which you sometimes see uh, in, in a California context. Again, this was not an extremely deep low pressure system, but it was enough because you don't usually see them in this region and the combination of instability uh, in, in the atmosphere uh, really got things going. And the last thing I want to show uh, on this map before I come back uh, and you'll see my face again is something uh, which is actually from the uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and their interactive uh, mapping from the most recent version of the uh, multinational IPCC report. This is essentially a summative uh, figure of all of the latest climate model simulations and what they think will happen 
in terms of relative percent change to the single heaviest rainfall day of the year. Uh, and this is not necessarily apples to apples exactly with what happened in Dubai because the event that occurred in Dubai recently uh, was far more than the wettest rain event you'd expect in a typical year, but this is the easiest, this is the closest analog uh, and is meant, intended to represent changes in the magnitude of one day per extreme precipitation accumulation. So what happened in Dubai was far more than a one year recurrence interval event, uh, but this is something that is the, the closest to apples to apples comparison that I can pull up uh, on short notice. And what I really want to illustrate on this map is a few different things. One is that there's a whole lot more green than there is brown. Uh, and again, this is not a map of average precipitation changes, but this is a map of the expected percent change at a level of warming about three degrees above the pre-industrial baseline. So this is at a relatively high level of warming. Uh, and I'll show you what it looks like closer to 1.5 degrees, which is closer to where we are now as well, as you'd expect the signal is a bit weaker. But while I have this map up, I wanna emphasize something. The Middle East and the Arabian Peninsula are actually one region on Earth where it, there's expected to be a local maximum of precipitation extreme increase in a warming climate. So for three degrees of warming across broad swaths of the Arabian Peninsula, including Dubai and the United Arab Emirates, a large region of a 30 to even 40% plus increase in the magnitude of extreme precipitation events. That's an extraordinarily large increase in the magnitude of events. And it is in fact higher in this part of the world than in most other continental regions. The region uh, over uh, this, this, this northern portion of Africa mostly corresponds, by the way, with the Sahara Desert. So here, uh, these are places where sometimes it doesn't rain for 20 or 30 years. So I wouldn't make quite as much uh, of these dark blue covers over the central Sahara Desert. But, you know, of all the populated places on Earth that see non-zero average precipitation in a given year... In some ways, it is actually the Arabian Peninsula and places uh, sort of the western I I portion of the Indian subcontinent, so including Pakistan and the western portion of India, uh, as well as portions of equatorial Africa that see the very largest projected increases in precipitation extremes uh, in a warming climate outside of the remote tropical Pacific, which for better or worse, very few people live in this band, unless I suppose you're, you live on the Galapagos Islands. So in terms of highly populated areas on Earth, uh, this is exactly where you would expect to see some of the largest and earliest emerging increases in the very most intense precipitation extremes. And this is partly because in a warming climate, this is one region where you actually have a confluence of factors that increase the risk of precipitation extremes. So the, region, the reason why this map is blue or green, depending on your level of colorblindness, almost everywhere, is that essentially uh, in a warming atmosphere, the expanding atmospheric sponge effect, as I've described previously, dictates that for every uh, degree centigrade of warming, there's about a 7% increase in the amount of water vapor in the atmosphere. So the ceiling on how intense precipitation can become increases on average by about 7% uh, per degree of warming. And notice how in a lot of regions on Earth uh, that the percent increase in extreme precipitation events is somewhere around the low 20 percent. That's sort of the color that appears in a lot of places, and that's pretty close to seven times three for three degrees of warming. In other words, there's pretty good evidence that that's a good approximation for many areas on Earth at the rate at which precipitation extremes will increase in a warming climate. It's true in mo many places. For most of continental North America, that's a pretty good estimate. In fact, it doesn't vary that much from region to region. Same for much of Western and Northern Europe, and for most of Australia and South America and Southern Africa and Southeast Asia. But the one big place, big populated place on Earth where that's not true is from equatorial Africa into the Middle East, uh, as well as portions of the Indian subcontinent. And the reason for that is here, not only do we have an increase in atmospheric moisture like we do everywhere else, but we also have an increase in what are known as the dynamic, the dynamic component, meaning that there actually is likely to be an increase in the number of high moisture events that correspond to 
high vertical motion events, upward lift in the atmosphere. Those are additive or even multiplicative factors, and that is why we see stronger moisture convergence in these tropical bands. Again, over the Pacific, this is affecting very few living people, but over equatorial Africa and portions of the Arabian Peninsula and Pakistan, this could be a quite high impact type scenario. You may notice that the very few regions that are brown, signifying a decrease in the most extreme precipitation events in a warming climate, are mostly over remote subtropical oceans. So once again, very few people live in this portion of uh, the Pacific Ocean off the coast of Chile. There might be a very small segment of coast in central Chile where people live where this is the case, but generally almost all of South America is excluded from this. Same thing is true in the southwest cape of southern Africa. Perhaps a very small region uh, along the desert coast of Namibia that doesn't see an increase in extreme precipitation events. Same, same is true for portions of coastal Morocco. But essentially, uh, this is one of the very few universal things, with the exception of a few island nations, particularly off the coast, uh, like the Cape Verde Islands, off the coast of Africa uh, and the Azores, uh, almost every place on Earth sees an increase, a substantial, roughly 7% per degree centigrade increase in precipitation extremes and warming climate, except that that number is potentially double that, so more like 10 to 20% per degree centigrade increase in places like equatorial Africa and, once again, uh, the Middle East, uh, play, uh, where we're talking about these events today. This is at three degrees of warming. Of course, we're not there yet. I hope we don't get to three degrees, although it's still well within the range of possibilities uh, this century. Uh, but let's take a look at uh, a two degree level of warming, which is a level of warming that we're almost certainly going to experience at some point this century. And you see essentially the same picture. It's just slightly muted. Um, it's the same overall argument. The magnitude of the increase is just somewhat less. But even here, Equatorial Africa and the Middle East pop out as hot spots relative to other places on Earth. So I think that's what I wanted to show in terms of imagery. You'll see my face again on screen. Uh, and that sets the stage for what I wanted to talk about a little bit in terms of um, the cloud seeding conversation. So a brief primer on what is cloud seeding. And to be clear, uh, you know, as many folks know, I'm a bit of a, a, a generalist uh, where I know a lot about, uh, well, I know a little about a lot of things and then a lot about a few things. Um, but cloud seeding is actually something I have followed over the years for a variety of reasons. And it's one of those things where the the public perception of its of its efficacy uh, and uh, the degree of influence is actually a lot higher than the scientific degree of certainty that it actually has meaningful effects. So there's a multiple ways to conduct cloud seeding. Uh, the most common, historically used and studied uh, modality is to very on very small local scales inject some sort of cloud condensation nuclei, usually in the form of some kind of salt. Sometimes it's a, a, a silver iodide uh, compound. Sometimes it's more, uh, as is supposedly in the case uh, of UAE, a more natural salt. So I don't know if that's uh, sodium chloride or magnesium chloride or something else. But the point is, uh, it, it offers uh, condensation nuclei on which droplets can form in clouds. And the goal is not to produce uh, storm clouds out of nowhere, uh, it simply cannot do that. You cannot manifest upward vertical motion in the atmosphere uh, by spraying some, some salt into the air, but it's to augment uh, the rain efficiency or the snow efficiency from existing clouds, either causing clouds that wouldn't have produced much, if any, precipitation to produce just a little bit, or encouraging uh, deeper clouds that were producing some meaningful precipitation to produce slightly heavier precipitation. That's the whole ball game. This is not something that can create storms. It can't even create clouds. And cloud seeding is usually done at the scale of individual updrafts and individual cumulus clouds. So this is not something that's done or likely to be effective across hundreds or thousands of miles. It's something that is probably effective on the scale of something like hundreds of yards to a mile or two 
in most cases, maybe up to 10 miles or so on some, some circum limited circumstances. Most of the research that's been done on cloud seeding has been done in cold or a graphic cloud environment. So for example, in the snowy, uh, snowy mountains in Wyoming, uh, there's some evidence that a very targeted cloud uh, seeding campaign can, uh, can increase orographic snowfall under certain specific conditions by up to 5 to 10%. Uh, that is probably the most compelling evidence there is out there that it has any effect at all. Uh, and there's some question as to whether this is really a systematic result because you might be able to squeeze an extra 5 or 10% of moisture out under exactly the right conditions on very limited areas under limited circumstances. Uh, but the question is whether that, that would even work at scale even if you tried to apply it at scale. And I think there's actually evidence that it probably would not. So it's unlikely that you'd be able to produce uh, five or ten percent more precipitation on any meaningful long-term basis. You might be able to do it for individual clouds or individual mountain slopes, but I think it would be very difficult uh, to to achieve this on other scales because what you're really doing is just you're not adding more moisture to the atmosphere. You're not creating storm clouds out of nowhere. You're really just encouraging existing moisture in existing clouds to fall out with a slightly higher efficiency uh, than you did before. And cold orographic clouds are very different than deep warm convective clouds, which are the type of clouds that produced the extreme rainfall in the Middle East this past week. So there's even less research on seeding a warm phase cumulus clouds. Maybe it's theoretically possible that you might have a similarly small effect at local scales. And there have been some papers that have come out on UAE's uh, uh, cloud seeding efforts, and quite frankly, I've read them, and I am not impressed by the level of scientific evidence that they present that the cloud seeding is actually doing much of anything. The main reason for this, and for really my skepticism regarding a lot of cloud seeding studies uh, uh, over really the last century, is that it's extremely difficult to construct a meaningful baseline, or in other words, a scientific null hypothesis or a control experiment. This is pretty fundamental to most scientific pursuits. Is you need to, if you're going to introduce an intervention into a system, you need to be able to quantify what would have happened if you hadn't introduced that intervention in some systematic and rigorous way. So in other words, what is the effective control experiment for a cloud seeding study? Because every individual weather setup is different. And if you seed during this event, but not during another event, how do you know that success or failure was actually caused by the seeding or was just due to random differences between different weather systems? We can't get two identical weather systems in the real world and compare them because that has never happened and never will happen. So it's impossible to have a perfect null hypothesis. There are ways to try and tease this out but the problem is a lot of these studies have really weak null hypotheses or control experiments, which is to say compare the precipitation that occurred during a few years where cloud seeding occurred to a few years where cloud seeding did not. A great example of why that could give you the exact wrong answer and doesn't mean much scientifically is what if you had done that same study, for example, during the peak California drought years, uh, which had nothing to do with cloud seeding recently, and compared them to the past two years, uh, where there's been exceptional to at least average, and in some cases exceptional precipitation. Uh, you might come to the conclusion that the cloud seeding ha had caused this effect when in fact it was just due to uh, other large scale forces at play in the atmosphere. And so the same thing is true with a lot of the studies that have been done regionally. I'm not saying that cloud seeding has no effect at all, but what I'm saying is it certainly didn't create the re remarkable large-scale storm system uh, over the Middle East. It certainly didn't uh, make the, the nearby uh, sea surface temperatures extraordinarily to record warm, adding a, a record amount of uh, column water vapor to the atmosphere leading up to this event. It didn't make the atmosphere unstable. It didn't cause the updrafts that triggered the thunderstorms. Uh, and so, and also the models, not knowing anything about any potential cloud seeding activities, essentially predicted the exact right amount of rainfall, record-breaking amount of rainfall, without having any a priori knowledge of the cloud seeding, which 
argues at a bare minimum that a physics-based model said that this could have happened completely in the absence of cloud seeding, and also tends to argue that even if it was ongoing or preceding the event, that it probably did not have a very large effect. It shouldn't have from a theoretical perspective. There's empirical evidence that the models that didn't know anything about it predicted it correctly anyway. And there's also you know, this, the, the, the general realization that even to the extent uh, that even if you, you, you're willing to believe the most favorable scientific papers despite dubious uh, control experiments involved, the most you would really get of cloud seeding is maybe a five to at the very upper end 15 percent increase on a scale of like one to ten miles at the most and this was a weather system that stretched over hundreds or even thousands of miles dropped a record-breaking amount of rainfall so generally speaking am i clouds uh, cloud seeding skeptic yes a lot of the the evaluations, a lot of the claims by water agencies and state agencies about the efficacy of, oh, we boosted the rainfall or snowfall in this particular sub-basin by 10 or 15% thanks to the efforts of such and such subcontractor. In most cases, who's providing the numbers? It's the contractor. So, I mean, I'm, I'm not necessarily saying that this is... Uh, unethical, but what I'm saying is that is not a rigorous scientific quantification of the effect of the cloud seeding, and there is inherently an incentive to say that, well, if, you're, uh, if you've been paid to engage in cloud seeding activities, that, that they actually did something helpful. Uh, and again, are there limited circumstances where it might help at the margins? Perhaps. Is it responsible for extreme weather events and catastrophic floods? No. Uh, does it have much of an effect in a general sense overall? I'm not convinced that it does. Is it a good use of money? That's not really my place to say, but if it isn't doing anything, then I think the answer is pretty clear. So I look forward to improved research on these topics. I could certainly be swayed if there's better evidence, but at this point, I don't see it, except some evidence that it works under limited circumstances at the margins on very small scales. The reason why I bring this up is that in the online discourse, all of these viral videos are circulating, suggesting that cloud seeding caused this event. And as I've now argued, that there's just really no evidence that that occurred. Interestingly, the government of UAE has also denied that there was any cloud seeding activities going on prior to the event. Whether or not that's true, I have no idea uh, and no way of evaluating, and there's been mixed reports in the media but my point is it largely doesn't matter, and this is a sort of ironic situation where I think overly bold statements about the efficacy of the program for nationalistic or uh, propagandistic reasons, I suppose. And by the way, this is a reason why a lot of countries do it. This has been common in countries with centralized authoritarian governments that have a lot to prove and want to exude uh, an image of being very powerful and claiming responsibility for, for either alleviating a drought or preventing a flood through seeding or other forms of modification is a compelling way to do so. And there is a pretty easy argument to make. It's not a correct argument or a scientifically accurate one, but from public perception perspective, it can easily be argued that, look, it finally rained. The drought has ended and we cloud seeded yesterday. So you can thank our cloud seeding program for that when in fact it would have happened anyway same thing in reverse to prevent rain clouds during major uh, political events or Olympic Games, for example, has been claimed in the past. I've seen little, if any, evidence that those things actually happened, despite the bold claims. Here, the irony is that I think that the, cloud, the, the folks behind the cloud seeding program are getting blamed for a, a disaster that I think very likely uh, had nothing to do with their activities, whether or not they were engaged in cloud seeding because... Ironically, I don't think it does much to begin with. So victims of, of overpromising, perhaps, and now having to distance themselves from the thing that was originally overpromised. All of that is a bit of a distraction from the reality that some of this, of course, is just due to natural variability. Sometimes extreme weather events occur on their own. But the other piece, as I mentioned, is there's probably a much more coherent climate change argument here than there is a cloud seeding argument, because we know that climate change is increasing the magnitude and frequency of extreme precipitation events 
pretty much everywhere over land on Earth, and especially in places like Central Africa and portions of the Arabian Peninsula. This is exactly a hotspot region for this because we have both the thermodynamic increase in moisture and the dynamic increase in moisture convergence, stronger upward motion favoring these tropical-like downpours even in erstwhile desert regions. So this is like a classic example, actually, of where we'd expect some of these effects to emerge perhaps the strongest in a warming climate. And it's interesting because in a certain sense you can view global warming primarily caused by the accumulation of heat trapping gases uh, via human emissions as a giant geoengineering experiment on a grand scale and another uncontrolled one by the way at least we can have we can create synthetic control experiments by using climate models but we didn't you know we don't have earth 2.0 uh, to test it on and so it's a giant uncontrolled experiment by increasing the, the level of heat trapping gases and sort of seeing what happens lighting a fuse and hoping that you know we can uh, extinguish it before things uh, get too explosive so the irony is that there probably is a human uh, fingerprint on this event, uh, the geoengineering fingerprint, if you will, but it's not in the way that people, I think, uh, have attributed it online to cloud seeding, which very likely had little or no influence at all, and climate change, which very likely made this event probably at least 7% uh, larger uh, than it would have been otherwise, and maybe something more like 10 to 15% bigger. And, you know, in an event like this, that's a pretty big difference. So, and certainly increase the likelihood of seeing this event by vastly greater percentages. In fact, what we've seen is that in a lot of climate model studies, if global warming has increased the magnitude of a precipitation event by about 20%, so, you know, a one inch rainfall event being a 1.2 inch event, uh, or a 10 inch rainfall becoming a 12 inch rainfall, uh, the likelihood of exceeding a given threshold based on the historical distribution, often uh, you can add a zero to it. So for a 20% increase in magnitude, often that translates to something like a 200% increase in the frequency of that event. So if we look at, the from a frequentist perspective, how much more likely was this event as observed, I would say it's probably far higher than 7 to 15%, probably something more like 100 to 200% more likely. This is not a formal number. I haven't done an attribution study. People probably will, but those are the kinds of numbers that I would be expecting to see. Something like a 7 to 15% increase in the magnitude of the event due to the global warming already observed, and maybe uh, a 1 to 200% increase in the likelihood, if not greater. That's a big increase, and it does matter. So that's my two cents on, on this. The other piece here, I think, uh, was interesting, and by the way, it uh, looks like there's a, a troll uh, in in the comments. So uh, I, you know, I, I would uh, encourage folks to flag uh, flag that as you see fit. Usually, YouTube does a pretty good uh, a pretty good job. Uh, let me just uh, deal with some of it myself. Uh, usually, YouTube does a pretty good job filtering those out, but it is helpful uh, for folks to flag things as they come in. Um, the other piece of this I think is interesting to ponder is what it means in the context of larger scale intentional geoengineering experiments or policies that might actually emerge in the 21st century. And I'm sure I'll get a lot of emails later today talking about uh, things like uh, aircraft contrails, uh, differentiated from the conspiracy theories surrounding chemtrails, uh, which I won't get into. Um, be careful if you Google it. Uh, you'll go down some rabbit holes and potentially get some computer viruses. But uh, long story short is that humans do modify the climate in more ways than I think a lot of people realize. And one visible manifestation of that is the fact that jet aircraft, when they fly, you know, at the upper atmosphere, uh, they produce uh, some water vapor uh, through the process of jet fuel combustion, which comes compressed out of the engines and produces these long linear cirrus clouds known as contrails. If you live near major flight paths, you've probably seen these. They crisscross the skies in a grid pattern, 
the conspiracy uh, as to why it's a grid pattern is actually just the fact that air traffic control has aircraft fly in a grid pattern so they don't crash into each other. Uh, that is why uh, cirrus contrails, which are, by the way, they are literally uh, chemically composed of essentially the same thing as natural cirrus clouds. They're just more organized and linear because they are produced uh, indirectly by the, the those jet engines of, of, of aircraft. They are primarily composed of water ice crystals. There are some pollutants in there from, uh, of course, the combustion of jet fuel is not does not only produce water, but uh, generally speaking, they are cirrus clouds, ice crystal clouds. They sometimes can expand and fill to cover the sky on days uh, when conditions are already favorable for uh, the formation of cirrus clouds. So sometimes you say like, oh man, how could these possibly be covering the sky? Well, they become a little bit self-sustaining uh, once you seed them. It is essentially a form of very localized cloud seeding. But in this case, it never produces precipitation that reaches the ground because these clouds are forming at 30,000 feet. They're only about a few hundred feet thick on their form of ice crystals. So uh, it's a very localized form of cloud seeding that nonetheless affects the climate because the contrails uh, can affect the Earth's temperature at the surface because they can either, depending on exactly where they are in the orientation, they can either warm or cool the Earth themselves a little bit. So it's much smaller than the effect of global warming, of course, but it is there. It is technically a form of geoengineering, and contrails do have some small, modest, but measurable influence on climate. One of these studies that demonstrated this beyond reasonable doubt, by the way, occurred um, in the in the few days following the September 11th, 2001 attacks, when uh, air travel over North America was essentially halted uh, and across much of uh, Western Europe to North America. So there was essentially a large region on Earth where there was virtually no commercial air traffic for a period of days, which gave a large enough sample size to measure because it was such a big artificial kick to the system, uh, the influence uh, that those, the absence of those uh, artificial cirrus clouds had on, on the system. All of that is to say that's one form of unintentional geoengineering that's not hugely consequential, but it is measurable and it does exist. In the future, you know, there, there's now rumblings about things like solar radiation management, SRM as a form of mitigating the amount of warming on earth by blocking out some of the incoming sunlight, uh, by essentially adding reflective particles to the stratosphere, and otherwise putting aerosols into the stratosphere with the goal of, re of reflecting a small portion of sunlight to prevent it from reaching the Earth's surface and therefore restoring the Earth's energy balance. Uh, I have a lot of thoughts about this that are complicated and we're already getting close to the hour, so I won't get into the details too much. Uh, I, I am not as uh, gung-ho uh, on that as uh, a lot of uh, climate advocates seem to be at this point. I think there are uh, it's not well understood at this point, and I think some of the claims regarding how well we understand it don't come from climate scientists who fully understand the level of uncertainties involved in certain facets of climate modeling. That maybe that's a conversation uh, that we can have in fuller form at a later date. But the main reason I bring it up in this context is that someday, whether or not I think it's a good idea, uh, some entity, uh, either a, a, perhaps a nation state, uh, an international consortium, or given uh, how wealthy some individuals have become these days, some very uh, high wealth, extremely high wealth individual, let's just say, might decide to do it unilaterally. And right now, there aren't very many treaties or regulations, uh, multinationally or internationally, that actually regulate this. So it's something that could just happen. And somebody might do it. We don't understand the effects very well. And there is some potential, actually, for solar radiation management to have regional climate effects. You might actually do something like severely curtail the South Asian monsoon or reduce rainfall over the Amazon rainforest. We don't fully understand that yet. But I think this is a good example on a small, even single city scale of what might happen in terms of the blame game. Geopolitically, what if you have an ex what if one country starts injecting some sulfur aerosols into the upper atmosphere to cool the earth. And then there's an extreme weather event that causes uh, mass economic or, or even human uh, loss of life in an adjacent country. Who's going to be there to argue that the solar radiation management, the, geo the intentional purposeful geoengineering didn't cause or contribute to that event? The problem is there's at least a plausible mechanism right now that on that scale, because that is global scale intervention, 
then it might be difficult to argue that it didn't have an effect, or there might be genuine scientific uncertainty as to the magnitude of the effect. And it's quite likely that in a geopolitical context, uh, nation states or individual actors with a, a, a particular bone to pick or pre-existing uh, interstate conflicts uh, needing an excuse might use it because there is genuine scientific uncertainty. Did nation A's actions affect the risk of this extreme event in nation B? Even if it probably didn't, uh, it has a ring of truth to it, much as uh, the, the widespread internet conception that cloud seeding caused the, du du the Dubai downpours. And at least in that case, there, there might be a slightly more plausible argument that we can't rule it out. So that gets real messy real quickly, and it's one of the one of the big challenges I think that we're going to see emerge this century as global warming gets worse, as the impact of extreme events becomes more pronounced, and as uh, enti uh, individuals, nations, and uh, powerful entities that are neither individuals or nations decide uh, that it's time to take matters into their own hands without a full understanding of what the broader geophysical or system implications might be, nor subsequent geopolitical implications, which need not actually follow from the geophysical implications. The problem is that interested parties might be able to use this as an excuse uh, to respond in certain ways. And I think this is a very important early lesson in how that might play out. So uh, I am not a geopolitical expert. I am not an SRM expert. I am not a cloud seeding expert. But I am a climate scientist and a meteorologist who thinks about big picture things, and this is something that I think may be coming to a head more rapidly uh, than is widely recognized. So uh, I think I'll leave it at that. I will look at the questions that have come in and, and talk about it, but this has been uh, hopefully a bit of a different day, uh, a different kind of conversation that folks, I, I hope you'll share and come back to because this may be of broader interest than the usual California weather crowd. So. Please do share, but now I'm going to go through and answer questions to the extent that they are. Thanks for the thumbs up, everybody. Yeah, there's a few folks who are glad uh, talking about cloud seeding. Uh, you know, there's there's a history of this. I believe I'm actually going to quickly Google something while I'm uh, on the on the line with everybody because I just am trying to remember this guy's first name. It's actually a part of Southern California history uh, and lore. I believe his name was Charles Hatfield. I'm just trying to see if I got it if I got it right. Um, yes, it is Charles Hatfield. Uh, and this, you know, this was something that occurred uh, in really in the, the early 20th century uh, in Southern California. In fact, there were a number of, uh, you know, this was the uh, peak, uh, well, uh, peak traveling uh, snake oil uh, salesman era. Uh, I suppose there's still snake oil out there, but there's less of the traveling salesperson variety these days more of it's uh, on the internet than at your front door. But there were folks who would go around the country and essentially offer to provide their, their rainmaking services at this time during periods of drought. Uh, and it, frankly, it was uh, much as a snake oil uh, uh, peddling is, is often predatory and preys on vulnerables or, de or desperate people or communities. Uh, th this was no exception. Uh, and essentially... To, even to the extent that we don't fully understand what, whether cloud seeding really works today, at least there's an argument to be made that maybe at the margins you can squeeze some extra moisture out with the right uh, at local scales. But the methods used back in the early 20th century and the 1800s definitely didn't work at all. Uh, things like firing a cannon into the storm cloud or uh, having a single burning pyre uh, near a town uh, that was suffering from a drought. These simply weren't large-scale enough interventions to, to do anything at all. But the way it worked, of course, was that these purveyors of rainmaking would go around, offer their services, and their good reputation was essentially because they were good salespeople. They would go to places, they were actually better meteorologists than rainmakers, and this is how they made it work. They would go to places that were experiencing droughts, 
uh, and wait for uh, a period where they had correctly, it turned out, predicted that it was likely to rain anyway, put on a big show of uh, putting all their instruments out and, and doing what they did. And then much of the time, within a day or two, it did in fact rain. Uh, but this was not so much because they were uh, they, they they had any magic uh, uh, behind their 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 methods. It was just that they actually had some ability to predict the weather, and they correctly recognized where drought-stricken communities were, and that eventually the drought would end, or at least there'd be a rain event that would ameliorate it to a certain degree, and they would go and do this, and then the, you know, and then the folks would say, "Oh my God, this worked! This guy actually came into town, did his thing, and then it rained, and the drought, you know, it, maybe it, it either ended or it got better," and that is how their reputation would grow by by being strategic about uh, about essentially. Uh, the performance that wasn't actually substantive. And so as a reputation grew, you can replicate the success even if you, you know, you're able to, re even if you don't have success every time, as long as you're somewhat reasonable about how you target things, uh, that's how people's reputations grew. Now, the irony, and this is almost the same thing that just happened in UAE, a very wealthy nation with very technologically advanced uh, society at this point, it's quite funny that exactly the same thing happened here uh, is that a lot of these rainmakers, including Charles Hatfield, I believe this was either San Diego or community in the San Diego foothills up upstream, eventually ended up being run out of town when a, a severe flood occurred uh, following one of these, uh, these uh, performances of rainmaking. And the irony is he wasn't responsible for that flood because what he was doing didn't really have any meaningful effect on anything. So, he was essentially a scam artist, scamming people uh, who paid him to provide services that weren't really working. And then ironically, in the end, uh, got run out of town because people blamed him for an event that destroyed properties and I believe killed people. Uh, that actually wasn't his fault. Precisely because, again, uh, he had oversold his abilities. And so people believed him. Uh, and that was beneficial uh, in the dry times, but suddenly became very uh, uh, a bit of a liability uh, when water became suddenly overabundant. And so this has, this has played out many times in history. I think this is kind of a modern example of it playing out again. Um, I wonder if we're going to see this happen re repeatedly. Uh, and I also wonder whether uh, we're going to see this play out on a much larger scale with potential proposals for solar radiation management and other large scale forms of geoengineering whether or not those interventions actually caused harmful extremes uh, subsequently, I am almost certain that interested parties will make the argument that they did and that it's going to be somewhat difficult to defend against. So I think that that's some interesting historical context. Look up Charles Hatfield if you're interested in the history. Um, I think every, everything old is, is new again, in a sense. Uh, in more ways than one at the moment. Uh, all right. Uh, let's see. Uh, a few more comments here. Yeah, I mean, a, a comment from Pixel Snob that the Weather Channel uh, headline was uh, cloud seeding to blame, question mark. Year of rain hits the desert in four days, which, of course, is a bit of a cop-out headline because I'm pretty sure the contents of the article is uh, starts off with, uh, no, it's not to blame, and yet... From the headline, you might you might assume otherwise, or you might at least assume that there was a, a, a legitimate debate. Um, so I hate headlines like that. Um, generally, though, uh, a good rule of thumb, and I think the journalists on the call may appreciate this: don't uh, blame the journalist for a headline that is misleading, because usually journalists are not able to write the headlines, even if they want to. Editors do. Uh, often they're very clickbaity, even for otherwise. Uh, very good uh, journalistic establishments, and it's just the perennial bane of my existence. Headlines, please read beyond the headline because often the contents of even the best uh, pieces of journalism is very different than what the headlines might suggest, and that is often, if not most of the time, not the fault of the journalists themselves. But that's a good example.
Uh, is it true? Just a very brief, I'll give a one word answer to this because I'm going to talk about it more in future sessions. Is this coming summer looking hot? I'm going to generalize this to across North America. The answer is yes. So uh, I will um, expand on that later. All right, well, uh, thank you everybody. Uh, hopefully this was an interesting session. Again, I would strongly encourage folks to share this. I think this is a good example of one uh, that's a little more broad ranging, uh, does not focus on California, although we, we tie it back to California as often as I can. Uh, definitely trying to grow the channel this year. Uh, and I'll be uh, hopefully making some announcements in the next few weeks and months. I'm still keeping my fingers crossed uh, because nothing is, everything's still up in the air, nothing is finalized. So potentially good news, but I've heard that before. So I'm not, I'm not, I'm, I'm holding my breath for now. Hopefully I didn't start to hold my breath too soon, but we'll see how it goes. Anyway, I will see everybody next week. Uh, topic and exact time TBD. Uh, but thank you everybody and uh, I'll see you next time.